welcome to another episode of Between Two Studs. I'm Alex Studd. And I'm Ron Studd. And Ron, for episode 42, we have on another relative, another kin. We have Christopher Goff tonight. How are you doing, Chris? I'm excellent. Thank you. Chris, we are so glad that you are on the show tonight. We're going we're gonna to kick things off. But before we do, Ron and I always, as a tradition, before we dive into the Ember Round, we pay tribute to our, yes, we pay tribute to our sponsor, Malort, the official spirit of Between Two Studs. So, cheers to you, Chris. Cheers. Very tasty, as always. Absolutely. All right. All right, we're ready. So, Chris, buckle up. You have entered what we call the Ember Round. Ember Round. So, I kind of alluded to it earlier, but you can tell the full story. How do you know Ron and me? Um, we're related. There you go. <laughs> um, so now we know. Yeah. My mom is the eldest sister of the, um, let's say, second generation Chisholm clan. I kind of like to put it that way. So we're cousins. And for those go. playing along at home, what a we had Jamie on before. <laughs> and and Jamie, <laughs> his mother. A brother from a different mother. There you go. Jamie's right. mother was the, the second oldest woman of the, of the eleven. Your mother was the first oldest. I don't even know in the pecking order. I know our mother is number seven of 11, but I don't even know the order of in terms of number woman. Four. She's number four. She was a fourth yeah. sister. Fourth, fourth, she, no, fourth uh, total. First, you know, first, first daughter. Uh, fourth total. Oh, I see. Yes. Fourth, uh, fourth of yeah. 11, right? Yes. Yeah. And our mother was seven of 11. So there you so, go. We pieced it, we pieced it together. So this is why, you know, I think we've commented on this before, but like at our family reunions, it's tough keeping everybody together, especially for, I don't know, there's, there's, comes a certain point where you're like, okay, so how am I related to that person? And my mom is always like, she's good at stuff like that. I am not. So she's like, oh, you know, that's so-and-so's kids, kids, kid. I'm like, I don't even know who so-and-so is to start at the beginning of that. But <clears throat> hey, yeah, I just say, yo, yeah, I just say, course. yo, it's let's, you. Let's, how you doing? I haven't seen you since that last event. So. Right. I, I mean, we're related. There you go. Yeah. So if you don't mind, Christopher, yeah. tell us a little bit about yourself. What are some of your areas of interest and passions? Yeah. Uh, so I enjoy traveling. I do that quite a bit. I uh, was happy to get back to it after COVID. So that was kind of limited for a minute. Um, mm -hmm. I enjoy photography, and I actually uh, like to read, and I'm really focused on personal development. That's a big part. Uh, so I'm always listening and always reading, and, and um, that, that happens to be just a lot of, of um, uh, so, you know, something I value considerably. Uh, I happen to also have a certain expertise in a very niche area, and uh, I think that's probably something we'll cover a little bit later. Love it. And you are a North Carolinian, North Carolinian. What, what do you call yourselves? North Carolinian. Carolinian. Got Carolinian, it. Yeah. Are, yeah. North Kakalaki. Are you the, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't Well, flow. see, you know, Ron and I used to always say North Kakalaki, but I, somehow I don't yeah. think that's, do people in North Carolina, do they, do they, do they get offended by that or do they, I, they yeah, like that? I don't I've heard it a couple of times, and I've also seen it on a on a, a plate or two, um, hmm. a vehicle, right? But I, I don't think I've ever heard that many people actually say it out loud, um, and so I don't think it's an offensive term that I'm aware of. There are far more better options for for folks in this. House. If you're trying to offend yeah, Southerners, <laughs> I think so, yes, hmm. yeah, well, Good fair enough. enough. Uh, we'll we'll touch on North Carolina in a little bit on the list but yeah uh yeah. next 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 uh next question in the ember round what are you currently drinking so i'm i'm sort of splitting splitting my um screen here between two options i got some coffee oh yeah uh, um and i got some uh some chick-fil-a um 
uh, lemonade. So that's um, and I got some I got some backups just in case as well. But oh, good within arm's reach. You got more. I have, I have, I, dude, yeah, I'm 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 all set. I got some I got some extra <laughs> stuff just to just. I love the variety stuff. too. You've got like what's hot. You've got what's cold. I got ice. You got the got sweet. Yeah, absolutely. You know, you got the bitter. Yep. You can just kind of come up with anything, and then you got the water too. It's the Boy Scout coming out, man. I just got to be prepared. Now, Chris, go. Chris, it's it's almost nine p.m. when we're filming this. Is that decaf or is that actual regular Not coffee? Actually, it's decaf, but I always do decaf. So I actually, okay. I didn't drink coffee until I was in my thirties, um, and I then started to appreciate the flavor for the flavor, not for the caffeine. So I actually don't drink. I drink only decaf. Huh. Yeah, you don't, you don't, you most don't, people, most, most people find that weird. So you don't generally drink caffeine like, uh, or like caffeinated beverages. No, no. Even on your long road trips, cause we're going to get into this. You go on these very long drives. You're saying you never drink like an energy drink. No, not anymore. I used to, uh, but not yeah. in the last, well, not in the last like four years. Um, vitamin D, um, the two things about that, right? Vitamin B, it works, but but also as soon as you actually like stop having caffeine entirely, uh, your body adapts, so like it figures out a way to be okay without it. <laughs> Funny. Enough. Wait, humanity survived before caffeine? Uh, yeah, I know it's crazy to think. I'm shocked that there are there are options beyond that uh, for for each of us. See, as you were describing that, though, all I could think of is like Jeff Goldblum from you know Jurassic Park being like, "Life uh, finds, finds a way, way. <laughs> <laughs> when it comes to caffeine not existing." Uh, I like it. Awesome. And for me, uh, let's see, I am enjoying some Knobs Creek, oh. some Ooh. rye whiskey here. Nice. And um, rye single barrel select rye. Very so cool. something a little. Something a little different. Thankfully for all of our listeners that have been wondering, I am done with that challenge. I'm not going back to that for a while. So, well, kudos for making it through. Thank yeah, you. I was gonna say it was very you impressive, you, Ron. You made it to the other side. Yeah. <laughs> what about you, Alex? I am working on. I've had this before. Woodford Reserve mm-hmm. Double Oaked, and mm. the Double Oaked makes it. I find it to be very smooth. I picked this bottle up. I was like, can um, you put it up a little bit higher? I can't. I couldn't. Oh see. yeah. Oh yeah. I picked this bottle up actually at at my bachelor party, Um, and it was actually our guy who gave us the tour. I said, what's your favorite bottle? He said the double oat. Um, So it's gone through two separate um, casks, right, Uh, where it's been aged, so in the barrels. So it's it's a little bit smoother. You know, I wasn't expecting these questions. I don't even know if it says on the bottle. But you know, I, if it doesn't I, I say it on the box, I should have submitted it ahead of time. I know. I expect like a, a list right ahead of time well, based on the drinks that you didn't I, know I was going to have. I, I was not prepared. So if it's <laughs> bourbon, it's got to be at least four years. So Is that the rule It's probably at least. Four, yeah, it's got to be at least four years. Although maybe we need Stu to come in and clear that up. There's a minute. It just says in, in order for it to be cold, this type of thing. Yeah. So all this says is bourbon finished in new Heavily toasted, lightly charred barrels. That's what it says. Heavily toasted and lightly charred. I know. I I'm know. Not sure how they you go... accomplish both things, but it's they they they, they chose to. Uh, the barrel makers found a way. Oh, you know, the the barrel the the coopers are are brilliant artists. Yes. Speaking of art, no. Speaking of artists yes. and creative minds, uh, a question we always ask our guests, Chris. We always say, pick a piece of art that represents you or speaks to you in some way, shape, or form. And as a recap, we've heard all sorts of answers over the, over the I almost said years. Ron, I guess we have done this over a year now, right? So over the year, over the year we've done Yeah, we're officially, we're officially past that. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. So Chris. More than one is year. Yeah. Year. There we go. All right. So, so what, what is, what is, what is the piece of art that speaks to you? Or represents you? You know, so I uh, I have to think of two different things here. So I'm going to, like, call an audible and go in a different, you know, go a little bit in the... Uh, oh, sure. Two, two ways, right? 
So okay. one of the pieces of art that really uh, that I connected with in my younger years, um, you know, since I'm so old now, but in my younger years uh, was was School <laughs> of Athens by uh, uh, Raphael. And that connected with me when I was a little bit younger and when I was in school and, and for a couple of years out of school because it was a it was a rendition or a portrayal of the evolution of philosophy, uh, really like Western philosophy. So it had the Greeks and the uh, Romans and 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 it articulated a little bit of the masters, if you will, of the of the evolution of philosophy. So I appreciated it for the representation, but I also appreciated Raphaelite artwork like paintings and that particular s style um during that during um, the renaissance so that that was something i would say over the years broadly it's been the written word and i appreciate quotable quotes i appreciate um uh books immensely and how let's say one-liners um just help with the making it through your day, getting your mind right as to where it is you want to be, uh, and, and all of all of those sorts of things. Like, and so I have to just give a little bit of credit and tribute to that concept, right? Just the art form itself. Your quotes, guy. I do. I do appreciate a quote or two for sure. Is there a is there a quote? Maybe I'm not saying your favorite, but maybe a quote that you read recently. Something that is kind of top of mind right now. Yeah, there are there are two that are that are kind of well, probably more than two, but um, the one that has been in my mind a lot lately is "Comparison is the thief of joy," and that was Teddy Roosevelt. Um, mm -hmm. And I think about it from a perspective of um, my evolution and and how I spent a, so much time comparing myself to others, and how that takes away. And it's not just myself; <laughs> I think people people in general have this. Uh, sure. how it takes away giving yourself credit for your own actions, right? Because you're so focused on every, but every, what everything else is happening, like what other people are doing, how you are, let's say somehow less than because, mm -hmm. because of that, it's because somebody's always going to be better at doing something than you, no matter what you do. Right. Yeah. Um, and the, the other one is success. Isn't a result of a spontaneous combustion. You must set yourself on fire. Uh, I just love I just love it because it's all about the evolution of growth and and success, and it's not like it's, it's the um, overnight success that it was ten years in the making. It was the same, you know, like that one hit wonder that took him twenty years. Yeah. It's that same sort of concept. It's not what we see, right? Is just that flicker, but it took a lot to get it to go. So that's one that uh, that I've always sort of connected with. And, and who, very, who who was that quote? Attributed to guys, the guy's name was Arnold Glasgow. Hmm. Huh. I it's, think it's you're very visceral, I, though. I, I remember it. reading a book on that exact topic. I think it might have been for business school, where I think we as a society we we see a great success by a person, and we go, "Wow, they must have just had a brilliant idea one day," and then the next day they became a smash hit. And it's like, yeah, yeah well, you might only be seeing the end result. But the work that went behind it um, was was significant. And I think sometimes we we just think, "Wow, these people got lucky." So I, maybe I'll just yeah. get lucky too. And then you, you're set you're setting yourself up for failure because nothing is really I, I don't think nothing is just pure luck. I mean, yes, there is advantageous you know situations, but at the end of the day. Uh, you're talking about years and years of failure before you have that moment of success. Yeah. It's the, it's the, uh, the harder I work, the luckier I get. Um, yeah, that exactly. Is, that is, yeah. That is sort of appropriate there. But I also think there's a certain amount of the truly the unseen. Uh, we tend to value ourselves only on what we can visually see, like what we, what we on a sensory level, um, believe or see what is physically in front of us and we forget all of the stuff like how do you get your mind right how do you focus on your emotions how do you do all the stuff behind the scenes that nobody ever sees right and we only see the you know like the game versus the practice right and none of that all of that is missed in our development as well 
And I, and I, I think it's a hard thing for us to consciously really be a, appreciate and aware of, of all of the junk and the noise and the reality, right? Yeah. Because we live just in this sort of superficial realm so much of the time. Yeah. But, you know, so I, I'm going to go, I'm going to go a little bit weird with this one, but let's just, Hey, let's, let's go with weird. I always like when Ron, when Ron starts a sentence, I'm going to go a little bit weird on this one. I'm always excited. <laughs> My ears always, Where you know, going to go. <laughs> yeah. But like, think about eighties movies, right? One of the biggest things that I loved about a lot of 80 movies. Gremlins. Okay, not applicable, oh. but we're, I'm just going to oh, keep going. Okay. It, it is in the, the training montages, right? Where you mm. get to see the start process uh. of, like, you know, Daniel Sun or, you know, Rocky. Where Rocky they're not quite Right, Absolutely. they're not where they need to be. And they just kind of go, and they go into it. And, of course, that's all compressed highly, and yep. you put some good synth music with it. But yep. a lot of that really is what gets you to where you need to be because if you just cut from like you know rocky four going against uh was it um what's his name drago Vlado or drago oh, if you just had cut to him just going against drago and just you know it wouldn't have that that power but knowing he that dies, he dies he dies right having that combined with him being out in the russian wilderness doing whatever he's doing it makes for a much better story too. But I think that's something where we tend to gloss yeah. over that with success. It mm -hmm. tends to just be kind of forgotten all that goes into that. Yeah. I, I have to say though, when you said montage, I couldn't help but think of the team America. Uh, song. Yes. Oh yeah. Uh, I just, that yeah. we said montage of like, Oh yeah, that's, that's, that's where my we mind went. Is a montage. <laughs> <laughs> you know what, what I, what I noticed about both of those quotes that you gave though, Chris and, I, I haven't I don't have them written down, so I'm going off of memory. Mm -hmm. Is they is they both really uh, at its crux? Tell me if I'm wrong. The way I'm interpreting them is you really can only control what you can control, right? And it's easy to look at others or you know be criticized by others or or see what is outside of your purview. But really, if you just if you take advantage of the situations and the opportunities that you have in front of you. You, you can find happiness and success, whatever you deem as success. Yeah, I, I there's a lot to that, uh, certainly, uh, and you can write volumes about it. But you're when it all boils down to it, you're absolutely right. It's the only thing you can control is you. Um, that's it. You can't control anyone else. You can try to or attempt to influence them, but it is it's just you. You you know your happiness is inside of you. Everything is inside of you, right? Every aspect of your you know, the world, the, the happiness that you want, the world that you want to be, the where you want to grow into, it's all something that already exists inside of you entirely. You just have to figure yeah. out the path to unlock it. You know, it's it's a little bit cheeky, but um, I remember when I was going through my adolescence, right, and you're, you're, you're developing and you're, you're awkward and you're weird. And um, there's a quote, though, from... <laughs> A band that I don't even know, Chris, if you knew them, but Ron and I were really into them for a while, Real Big Fish. And one of the lines from one of their songs says, No matter what, no matter who, no matter what you do, someone will always hate you. Hmm. And you know, it's funny, I remember listening to that song like in my teenage angst. And that's that that line still comes up from time to time, right? Like you can sometimes you try so hard to be a people pleaser, at least I do sometimes, where it's like, well, I don't want anyone to hate me. But at a certain point, the reality is there's people who do hate me, you know, and that's okay. There's like nothing I can do about it. You know, it's yeah. interesting because I'd heard a line from somebody and it was an entrepreneur kind of recently. They said, you know, when you've made it, when you got haters, that's a thing. You, you have done something significant enough for someone to dislike what you've done, which means they've given you that energy that you, that, that didn't exist before because you did something you you became so vulnerable you yeah. put yourself out there and you created something of significance significant enough for someone to dislike you and it that i think there is something to that yeah huh although Very. although i only knew like two real big fish songs so i wouldn't say i was really big into them. <laughs> most like, people only know one so you're you know more yeah. than most well yeah well, i'll take it one up them literally <laughs> 
All right. So our next question, and this is something that we added this season, uh, nice. but name one way that COVID, how it has permanently impacted you um, since it started. For Alex and I, a big thing for us was starting this podcast. So hopefully something are. positive, but there's certainly negatives too. But share with us one thing that has changed for you. Yeah. Uh, well, I'll go with the positive too. Um, and I would say I had the opportunity to spend a lot of time networking with people. So I went off the road, uh, for the first time in like a decade. Um, and was like at home for like six weeks and, and was like going absolutely crazy. Um, because that was about three weeks longer than I had been like home in forever. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, um, in that I started to network with people and, and what was great about it is people were craving that same sort of human interaction as well. And a lot of the networking just turned into true engagement with people and trying to figure out uh, or, or um, the goal that I wanted to do to fill a little bit of a void of, of mm -hmm. that human interaction. And I had the opportunity to talk with a couple of people. And mostly for me, because I was in sales operations for uh, like 13 years, um, a lot of old sales leaders, they moved on to other companies, right? So a lot of it was just, you know, hey, what are you doing now? What's going on? You know, how are you catching up with the old folks? All that sort of stuff, right? You so know, were you just were you just reaching out to people on LinkedIn? I mean, is that yes. what it was? Yeah, yeah. So interestingly enough, I grew my network via LinkedIn and just was saying, hey, let's get on the phone. Like, let's get on Zoom. And at that point in time, everybody was like comfortable with the idea of getting yeah. on Zoom. Now, now people are like, okay, I'm, I'm sort of like off of that again. But back then, right, early 2020, it was like absolutely so long ago. Well, <laughs> it's 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 funny because it is it has cycled, right? People yeah. people are now back to the it's too difficult. Um, but back then they were like, absolutely, I'd like to talk to another human being, right? Um, but during that during that period of time. I, I got introduced to, to um, somebody that um, he, he runs a nonprofit and it, I, he, needed, he needed guidance, which is actually part of the impetus for my book, um, it, on um, growing a sales organization. And so it really prompted me to think about like starting from scratch, what is it, like how can I add value to this person? Right. And it helped me reiterate a little bit of my approach in like everything that I do, I try, I'm trying to add as much value as possible. And I think that's one of the great things that I, that I have as a takeaway, in addition to growing my network and, and having meaningful engagements with other, with other human beings. But it, but it gave me an opportunity to really think about well, what, it, what is it that I do and how could I articulate that for someone who doesn't know anything? You know, it's very different to be able to, to sort of put something together with someone who is, has a blank slate versus someone who has a certain expectations of the way things ought to be because they have essentially some baggage of that history. So it, it helped me figure, figure things out um, yeah. and, and work towards something. Oh. Well, and we're going to talk about your book uh, in the second half of the show. So we're excited to get into that. But I, I think that is that is that is very interesting because it's true. There, there was those couple months where I think people were going crazy. Um, oh, people yeah. didn't know what to do. And so it sounds like you took advantage everybody of that was, in a good way. And, and everybody was locked up and everybody yeah. was like, we can't go anywhere. We don't know what we're going to do. You know, you didn't really even have all the like, the restaurants were closed. I mean, like the ordering of stuff, ordering of food. I mean, it wasn't even all like in sequence yet. It was there was a lot of these two weeks turns into two months, then turns into two years type of thing. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and this was super early on, like March through August. It was everybody was perfectly fine with the idea of like, yeah, I, I'd love to talk with anyone who will listen because I'm <laughs> literally craving human interaction. Right. Yeah. And if I'm not mistaken, I think that's actually Alex. Um, uh, when we started uh, talking and actually Ron, too. Right. We started talking semi regularly um, uh, during that period of time. Right. Like, I, I, you know, getting on at least somewhat 
Yeah, I think it was. I think so. Month, but you know, like I think that's actually when we started too. Yeah, that's a really good point. So, hey, Chris, congratulations! You passed the Ember route. So, kudos to you. There you go. So, we're gonna start going into some of the meat of the questions here. Uh, yeah. This first question I had that I uh, that I thought of. Uh, we've never done this before, but okay. I think this will be very interesting. So, so more or less, we already established you are a North Carolinian. Is it uh, and in fact, as a kid growing up, I, I would say Ron and I grew up in Western New York. When I thought of North Carolina, I thought of the Goffs. Right? You were my representation of what North Carolina is to the world. So yep. Rod and I are going to go back and forth. We're going to give you uh, some words or phrases or, or beliefs that have a tie to North Carolina. You have five words. We're going to strict you on this. You have five <laughs> words to, to comment positively, negatively, indifferently. You can use less, but you can use up to five. And we're going to get some really interesting responses. Are you ready? Well, I will do my best to follow the rules, but I am not going to make any promises. All right. All right. Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> Roughly five. All right. All right. So we're yes. going to go into this. All right, Ron, so we're going to go back and forth on the list. I'll start. All right. Okay. First word. First word. Cheer wine. Uh, very good. Glass bottle. Oh, very good. All right. Carolina barbecue. Compared to other barbecue. Better. One word. That's all you need. That's all you need. Better. All right. But the I Outer would, Banks. I, probably would add, I would probably oh. add coleslaw as well. Coleslaw. Okay. Gotta kind of have coleslaw. All right. You're still good. With, you were, that, that puts you at three. So you're good. Three words. You're good. Uh, outer Banks. Hmm. It would be a kitty hawk. You know, I don't know how else. How about else to uh, represent Kitty that? Hawk? Uh, that's it. it Beaches like, tourist. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> oh wait, uh, brew through. Right. I, you know, I don't. I, I don't remember if I know that's more s southern beaches, but I can't. I don't re really remember if if the Outer Banks had it. I just can't. I can't recall. I haven't so, gotten out so there in a long time. They do, but. Um... Yeah, I, I just love the concept. I'm not sure like how great it actually is. I just like the concept of being like, yeah, yeah. You just drive through, drive through, totally. and totally. You just say, I want that thing. And Efficiency. That thing. All right, moonshine. Go for the real thing. <laughs> I like that Ron is Ron is counting the words. Uh, I'm being a judge tonight. Last time I was in North Carolina, which was actually visiting. You, uh, I heard someone say, "Oh, bless your heart." What, what What do you think about people who say, "Bless your heart"? Uh, it's adorable uh, and accurate. <laughs> For those that really understand what that means, there you go. As somebody who's moved to the South, I I, I was definitely like ears all up whenever somebody would say that. I really haven't heard that it that much, but yeah. there's been times where people, when they use it, you're really like, mm, mm -hmm. they had it coming. Oh yeah. Just like, mm -hmm. yeah, it, it, it is. I think it might be a generational thing because I think, I think years ago it was used far more often, but I also think that like where I live, is not really a Southern town. And I think actually where you live, it's probably mm, kind of sort of a Southern town. Right. I think yeah. Atlanta, like Atlanta used to be more of a Southern town. It's not so much. And Raleigh definitely isn't. Um, not with RTP area. Gotcha. All right. Krispy Kreme. That'd be hot and ready. Used to be good. There we go. All right. Yeah, they're not, not quite as good anymore. Not anymore. All right. What about this one? The belief that Southerners are actually genuinely nicer than Yankees. Absolutely. One word. That's it. All right. I seem to work. <laughs> NASCAR. Never got into it. 
Ricky Bobby would also be acceptable. <laughs> Ricky Bobby, I like that. A good alternative. Um, I have to say I like the origins of it and probably the earlier years. And then it, I think it, it just got too commercialized. But that's all from not even somebody who really pays attention to it. It's just what you see as the evolution of of something uh, from what what appeared to be truly like just somebody having fun and racing as fast as they possibly can to something that's super, super commercialized. And it's really like every square inch is someplace that requires some advertisement. You know what I mean? And it's tough to watch that in such a short period of time because it's a yeah. very young sport. Well, and it's weird too because I feel like with NASCAR – I don't know if this is just me, but I don't even think of motor motorsports anymore. All I think of is NASCAR culture. It's, Hey, we're coming together. I mean, if, if you wanted to do like a grateful dead festival or you wanted to do parrot head festival, that's kind of what it is. It's a bunch of people getting together, right. doing their thing, enjoying their time there. And I'm not even sure everyone's really there for the motorsports itself. It's just like, Hey, I'm here because it's yeah. culture. It's fun. Yeah. You're probably right. Kind of like uh, college football. It's about like right. going out there on a Saturday, um, hanging out, eating, drinking, and not even going in, right? You're, right. Like right. you just have the TV right there and it's on while you're while you're hanging out. Yeah. All right, I've got a few that I didn't add on here. Well, actually, this is just a separate thing. I'm going to add on here. Let's go for so, it. I mean, that's why not, right? Mm -hmm. um, you so I'm curious. What are the differences between North Carolina versus South Carolina? Mm. Like, how do you, what's, what's the line in the sand? Like if somebody's like, oh, you're from South Carolina versus North. Um, I, I think the clearest one is the style of barbecue, uh, that there mm -hmm. are different sauces specifically in those different geographies. And in fact, there's a Western North Carolina and an Eastern North Carolina, and then more of uh, South Carolina, funny enough. Uh, that's that's one of those ways where you can kind of you can kind of see it. Um, I'm trying to think of what would be something else between the. I mean, two. barbecue is a good to, division point, though. It, it is, but there's also like the you used to go to South Carolina when gas was cheaper and you get fireworks. That was a thing, mm. right? Because in North Carolina you couldn't get fireworks, so that was. And south of the border, of course. Well, yeah, south of the border on the one side, right? I mean, <laughs> yeah, you have that. You got all the signs. They they remind you of of that. And the other thing, I think, in North miles. Carolina, in North Carolina, there's a considerably more. Um, although I'm sure there'd be some disagreement on this. Like, there's more military in that mm. uh, Camp mm. Lejeune, um, and um, like that whole fa like outside of Fayetteville area. Um, uh, obviously, there's a military school in South Carolina, so I say that, and that's why I said people will disagree. But, but you get you get the idea. Uh, more bases. Um, and that's that's all I can think of. All right, one more question too. Let's go back in history. Instead of it being North and South Carolina, mm -hmm. it is now West and East Carolina. Mm. How would you envision that working out, and what would be the differences in that that case? Apparently, the barbecue. <laughs> Clearly, barbecue is going well, to be the differentiator. Yeah, there. I mean, there is the the thing that does differentiate. I think more of North Carolina and South Carolina as well is that there is clearly like a low country, um, mm -hmm. and there's more mountains. So on the western side, there is clearly mountains, um, and there is a difference where of the people that moved there, uh, and it's more of the of the actual Highland folks, you know, the Scottish Highland folks. Mm -hmm. Uh, that moved moved there, and you have more Germanic as well. On the South Carolina and certainly the Islander side, you definitely had more of the Caribbean and the Creole, and we had more of, of this, like, low country culture. So it depends on where the line is drawn, but there is definitely, like, a low country and seafood style versus mm -hmm. a more of that, I think, robust and probably the hog that prompted a lot of the barbecue. Uh, mm -hmm. That would be the, the dividing line. I would see it from a food separation. Yeah, well, and as, and as someone who has no ties to North Car or the Carolinas, uh, to me, it's like you have the coastal, and then you have the Smoky Mountains, right? And to me, that would be a pretty big div division. I mean, you go to Asheville, that's a totally different vibe than like. Yeah, well, you that's know. 
that's the Austin of Carolina, right? That's the totally yeah. keeping it weird type of, uh, you know, area for, for North, for North Carolina, for sure. Um, but, but yeah, there's definitely a, we get hills and we have, then we have mountains and we have more isolation, more rural areas, quite literally, versus more populated areas. Um, Charlotte being somewhat, somewhat the dividing line there. So it just depends again, again on where you draw the line. Yeah. Well, hey, you have represented so the people of North Carolina wonderfully, I have to say. So thank you for that. I, and well I, done. Actually, I, I was meaning to at least drop like a, um, like two other lo- some semi-local sodas as well, since you mentioned cheer, since you mentioned cheer wine. And I was thinking you got to you also like um, favorable mention on Sundrop and even like an RC Cola because you kind of you kind of have to bring in some of those types of southern drinks as well i didn't know those those had carolina roots well sundrop definitely does i have i i'd almost like hate to be wrong about where rc cola actually comes from i just remember it when i was going to school in salisbury that they had a a um a you know like a, a soda machine and it had all of like these sodas that i'd never really even heard of right yeah and it was all of like what was literally bottled right there in salisbury and cheer wine was one of them, and it had Sun Drop and had RC Cola in it. It was, it was like my first experience of all of those things, those regionalized beverages. Well, it's interesting too because I'm like 95 percent sure. Isn't Pepsi? Wasn't that wasn't that created Born in North Carolina. Carolina as well? Yeah, it's, it's yeah funny because Coke and Pepsi are Southern. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, but it, it's interesting that that sodas. Uh, we're, we're such a hotbed in the Carolinas. Yeah, it, it is. It is interesting, right? So we, we like our sweet and it fits with the sweet tea, I suppose. Yeah. Oh, huh. well, now we know. Yeah. I was like, hey, you got so moon, you got moon pies and you got all kinds of other fun stuff, too. <laughs> we're going to do one more question before we go to break. Speaking of sweet, uh-huh. hmm. um, you know, for as long as I've known you, Chris, you and your wife have always been big in the fragrances. And I thought it'd be good to bring this up because I remember you know, scented candles, essential oils. I'm very curious, you know, what, what drew you to these? I, I would say, I mean, I hope I'm not being facetious or exaggeration, but I think it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a part of your life, right? Like you, you, you like these things. Can you talk about that? Um, you know, I, I'd be curious your thoughts. Sure. So I, um, I got into uh, direct sales years ago, uh, and I kind of actually grew up in an Amway family, uh, and and it's a direct sales and the notion of of kind of um, you know really like building relationships, developing um, uh, skill set to 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 sort of sell right um, was something that. I almost grew, grew up into, right? And candles was something that um, uh, Tanya, my wife's um, uh, mother, actually sort of got into and really to start off, we support support her in that venture. Tanya always liked candles anyway, so it was like, well, this is instead of Yankee Candle. And what we, what we got into back then was something that was just, um, uh, it put out less um, soot because it was like actually a natural... It was like natural scent and it was a soy based candle. And so it actually, it was better, cleaner than alternatives. Right. And it also burned a little bit lighter. So that was a thing where, you know, it was family related candidly. Uh, and, but it was also something that I didn't have a, a allergic reaction to because I could, I always had a challenge going into like a Yankee candle, um, and, um, not being completely overwhelmed, um, <laughs> with that, with the strength of the sense. Um, and for me, I was always embracing the notion of uh, the skills that would be picked up in the practice of putting myself out there, you know. And so we did events and all that sort of good stuff. A lot of it was learning things uh, specific to to the sense, specific to how candles work, all that sort of good stuff, right? Fast forward a, a moment. Um, that was then to essential oils, much the same thing. It's direct sales. We did, we've done events, all that sort of good stuff. Not, not as much into it as we used to be, um, uh, because for a, a hot minute, you guys probably are aware of this, right? Like it was everywhere. 
quite literally. Mm -hmm. Like it was nowhere and then boom, everywhere, right? And and it's still sort of present, but not as big as I think as it was maybe three years ago, something like that. Obviously, mm -hmm. like everything before COVID. Um, but the, the it was an opportunity to grow a business, to um, uh, again be out there, f contemplate like working on building something, and that was a big part of it for me, right? Mm -hmm. So that at its core. I would say Tanya, my uh, my wife Tanya, is probably more on the um, appreciating the, the scents. Uh, the passion probably, for the fragrance. I was probably mm -hmm. more of the appreciation for the how do we turn this into uh, a viable business and mm -hmm. how can I grow it into something. Not to say that it wasn't uh, an aspect that was meaningful, right? Uh, but I think the production of a business, the... Uh, development of, of of a marketing plan, selling, doing events, all that sort of stuff, tends to be more of the interest I have in in these sorts of things. It just so just Chris, in general, the notion of what you're business. what you're telling me is is your wife is the Steve Wozniak to your Steve Jobs. Do I got it right? Perhaps, perhaps. <laughs> I I'm not dressed like like um jobs of course but um i don't know who is elizabeth holmes <laughs> <laughs> awesome thank hey. you people no that that's i appreciate the perspective uh because yeah. that's something it, it, it is something i will say this you were talking about essential oils in my mind long before all of a sudden everyone on earth was talking about it um so I, I give credit where credit is due. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Hey, so we are going to go to break. When we yep. come back, uh, I actually do have a question about RVs for you. But then we want to talk about this book. Um, this is a book that I know you've put a lot of time, a lot of your heart and soul into. And I want to make sure we dive into it. Uh, I think it's really exciting that what you've done. And we're going to talk all about it when we come right back. Awesome. Hey, I know what you're thinking. Right now might be a good time to go and get a quick break, but here's the thing. I'm thinking that you could also use this as a good opportunity to like, subscribe, and drop a comment on this video. It would help us. It would also get the search algorithms to make sure that this video pops up for more people. So we'd really appreciate it. Hope you enjoy the rest of this episode. Thank you so much. Bye. Welcome back to Between Two Studs. We're hanging out with Chris Goff. We were just having a great conversation, talking all about the South, talking about fragrances. I don't even know where else we were talking about. We, we talked about a lot of things. Uh, and we want to get into your new book, Chris. But before we do, I selfishly have a question to ask. We already know that you are a big traveler, right? You are a road warrior, go on the road a lot. And you and I were chatting a lot during COVID. Um, and you were talking to me about this, this idea, this idea of buying an RV and seeing the world uh, through the RV, right? And, and every time we got on a call, which is like, what, once a month or so, yep. you'd be like telling me new things. And I'm like, you're introducing me to a whole new world, right? To quote the Aladdin song, a whole new world. So my question for you is, um, talk about that. Tell us. Like everything as it relates to RVs, how did you get into it? What's your exploration? How are you doing research? The whole thing. Yeah. Um, and the, it's interesting that you, you know, you bring it up because um, we, we were like a little all over the place to be perfectly honest. <laughs> we, it's like Tony and I knew we wanted to, to just go. Right. And that was a big, that was a big motivating factor because what I do can be done from wherever, as long as I have internet access, that's kind of the nature of the work I do. Right. And, and the, the things that we learned was, was preference to a certain extent, but also a lot of figuring out like what works in those different classes. So there are, there's a couple of basic like classes of RVs and it's pretty much ABC. Um, and a happens to be the big ones that 
everybody knows about. And those are, those in a lot of cases are also diesel, but they're like the forty foot long ones, right? They're the big buses, right? And then there's then there is the um, the C's, um, which are can like or can be more like the uh, vans, right? And there's a couple of options of that. And then I think a lot of people think of an RV. They're actually thinking of like the Class B, um, and like the one from Spaceballs, um, like where there's the thing, <laughs> like the thing that carries over the top, right? Yeah, like, yeah. The little sleeper part. That's what a lot of people think of, like specifically for um, um, like RVs, right? And so we thought about, well, what is it that we would really want to use it for? And because because each of them have essentially like different purposes or different setups that fit whatever it is your your intent is uh and you know some of it is like truly like a living in it some of it is is getting to a certain place and like camping right and and a little bit of a combination therein right um and we we like the class a right for all of its extras right Mm -hmm. uh we liked the power of the diesel and so we actually we were going to buy one, and we were down in Florida. Um, my brother was actually with us at that time, and we decided to go get lunch. We had been looking, and we'd been there for a couple hours. It was actually a um, – a, it was a Winnebago tour, um, and it was this was like a 40-foot-long um, uh, diesel um, – actually, I had two bathrooms, so, like, mm. we aren't talking about anything Whoa. small, right? Mm. And we, we, we leave – to go get some food and hear on the radio that the um, Colonial Pipeline was just un- was under ransom attack. And I don't know if you guys oh, remember that. I remember that. Um, where it was like in the southeast for a uh-huh. hot minute. You really couldn't get gas. And it felt like an omen. Mm. Literally. Uh, if I can only buy 10 gallons, I can literally pull up to the next gas station and wait while I get another 10 gallons so that I can get to the next gas station. And because, you know, these, these big, these big, um, vehicles are like, you know, between, I don't know, three and six miles of the gallon on diesel. And so it was like, you're not going to get too far. Um, so we just, we just took that as a, the universe is trying to tell us pause. So we not did. the right moment. And, yeah. And, and we, there's another one that we really like. It was a horizon. Um, was, it was another class A. It was just, it was just beautiful. Right. We love the idea and we just kept taking it for what it was. And it, the other thing, the other thing is back then when we were first looking, like everyone else was looking at the same time because everybody was of a similar mindset. Right. So you couldn't even find that many options. And, and, you know, fast forward a minute, you know, you're at like more than $6 a gallon for diesel. Um, you know, spend a couple grand just filling up to go like 200 miles would be a bit of a um, challenge, <laughs> you know, <For> sure. <laughs> so, so it, it, that's, that's kind of where we, where we ended up. Uh, honestly, for, for me, a big part of it was just going out West. I really missed going out West. And, for, and a lot of it is Utah and Wyoming and Montana, just big sky country. And it's just so different from the East coast. So that was a big that was a big aspect of one of why or and how I wanted to, to be able to sort of experience the, the country. Well, and that was gonna be my question. I was gonna ask, I was gonna say, all right, imagine you had the class A and imagine gas is back to a reasonable price. Somewhat reasonable, yeah. Do, do you have I mean, do you have that like first long road trip? Do you have it all marked out? Like you know where you're gonna go. I think it's 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 a uh, one of two, well, probably three routes. Um, so it would be a little bit of player's choice. More likely than not, we would probably do more on the um, middle through the country, and do like from from Raleigh to Nashville, from Nashville to Kansas City, from Kansas City to Denver, and from Denver up to Salt Lake. Um, but a lot of it, uh, that's kind of the thought, right? Uh, and that Utah area, uh, and that's just because. Um, if we did sort of the 80, 85 and down and then through, you know, the deserts of Texas, right. That's a bit aggressive, uh, usually during the summer in terms of heat. And then the North side has some mountains, which is a challenge 
for any of those big vehicles to to make it up like 77 or 81 um, and, and sort of manage that. So we were thinking sort of mid-country flat flatter options where possible um so, so yeah i think i think i have a decent idea about uh, some some opportunities to uh, to get out there but for me it's certainly like jackson hole is just a place i love the grand tetons um up 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 in that neck of the woods is definitely just a place i miss getting out to is this still a possibility at some point in the future or have Always. you walked away from it i i i rarely walk away from anything completely it's just okay. there's a long list of of so many things that I I definitely would love to be able to to have that. But I also, want you to have it so you can pick me up in Chicago. Absolutely, Wait, and then I'll me. and then I'll come with you. Don't forget me. Well, and and just as a side note, I I was surprised. Like these Class A's that you're talking about, these are phenomenal. Like there yeah. is some pretty crazy like custom engineering that has gone into these. I, I don't know. I, I took a look like this is unrelated to, the, to this podcast, but at one point I saw some video about some guy who was like, yeah, I, I like to, you know, carry my Lambo around in one of these class A's that fit underneath Absolutely. and literally like it like goes out and then it just like goes back under. And it's like, yeah, cause you know, there's times when you want to go around with your Lambo and I get it. I don't have one personally, but you know, but why wouldn't you? Like, there is, like, custom precision that goes into these things. And it's amazing. I think it's it, I think it's fantastic. And, and there's a huge range on price, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, so, but but most of them are literally in that half million new range. Yeah. And that's starting point. So it is something that is not a thing where you get a return out of. It is mm-hmm. a thing that you know you're going to, it's going to be an expense and you have to look at it from that perspective of the value you get out of your experience with life, right? Rather than thinking about this, this is not economical. Right. It is right. definitely well, this isn't, with consumption, right? With this isn't a house where you, you would expect it to appreciate over the long term, right? This is a vehicle. It's, it's more like a yacht, I think, at that point, because it's like I'm going to go see parts of this country in luxury in a nice way that Absolutely. I wouldn't see you know, otherwise. And when you yeah, consider yeah. that, it's like, yeah, I can go wherever we want to go. We'll have comfort. We'll do it in class the way we want to do it. Yeah, that's exactly right. And that, that's it. So I, like, never leave my home um, and my and the luxury of my surroundings as part of my journey across the country. Awesome. All right. Well, we got to get to that book because I know you've talked to me about it. Alex and I have heard about this for a little bit. But I know that you you spent over fifteen years, in in various business analytics uh, operations and sales compensation types of roles, right? And you've recently published a book called "Starting Simple: Sales Compensation," which is available currently on Amazon.com, right? Would you mind talking to us a little bit about that book? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, of course. Um, happy to. So, so going. It, uh, went live um, Friday the thirteenth, so I just I, I I just thought it was appropriate. Uh, so May thirteenth is is when the ebook and uh, paperback um, kind of came out. Uh, I, as I as I spoke to earlier, a lot of it came from this exercise of uh, giving guidance to this nonprofit, and they needed to hire a couple salespeople, and they ha- were literally starting from scratch. I got put in touch with um, George is his name. Um, and for me, it was definitely like an opportunity to think about if I'm going to give guidance to somebody, right, who doesn't have any perspective at all, what exactly is it that I'm going to tell them that's going to add value and not either confuse them or or uh, at least leave some level of, cl- of clarity that will be helpful in the future? Because that's, that's, that's the thing. So in the world of sales compensation, you know, really you're trying to figure out how to design incentives uh, that align people, right, the employees, to the business objectives, right? So it's a path of developing these methods of compensating people appropriately for 
their behavior and have that mm -hmm. positive reinforcement that then sort of confirms or reinforces how the business outcomes work, right? An ideal scenario, a salesperson makes a lot of money and the business makes a lot of money. That's the mm -hmm. ideal outcome of, of um, this sort of thing. So uh, I, it's been many years in the making in terms of, of um, working, you know, on sales ops and, and uh, compensation jobs. And, and uh, you know, what the premise of the book is quite literally, uh, assume you have to hire your first salesperson. Mm -hmm. What do you need to know? And in this case, I start with culture because from my perspective, the more, the thing that is actually more important is, is ensuring that you got the right fit of person, uh, in the job. Then it goes into, uh, talking about the math, right? What can you actually afford as a as a startup, right? Yeah. You know, well, and it's it, interesting you say that. Cause that was like one of the first things I thought of is, yeah, it's that, how do you figure out the culture? And then also the salesperson to kind of work with that because it can be very uh, mutually beneficial if you have those very much in, in alignment, right? Because you're going to foster the type of culture that you want for that business. And you're also rewarding that success in a way that it makes sense and will organically drive the future of the yeah. business, right? Yeah. And a, and a founder you know, it, it, who usually is the salesperson, let's be mm -hmm. honest, in most cases, right? Um, or they're attempting to, to be the salesperson. Um, has a way of doing things and you have to be able to either be comfortable letting go or mm -hmm. passing the reins or evolving in some capacity. So you do have to find a person who's willing to take on the reins, take on the risk. Um, it has to be the right type of person that fits in that particular sort of difficult scenario of, of all of this unknown, right? The chaos is where they have to be comfortable living. And a lot of people, and this is not just sales, a lot of people like that in a startup, the environment associated with, this is a little more cavalier. This is a little more like, I don't know what I'm gonna be doing today because I'm, I literally wear three or four hats in a small company, right? And that's okay, right? But it's very, very different from an established company where people have more specialized jobs versus mm -hmm. like, I'm a fully generalist because if I'm called to do something, I do it because I'm so in sync with the business actions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really interesting. Do you mind um, kind of telling us a little bit more about the actual writing process? I mean, this is your first yeah. book ever. What was that like? Challenging. <laughs> uh, in one word, um, it, it was uh, there was a lot of figuring out, figuring out if you will, um, in this case, understanding <clears throat> a little bit of the, what it is that I could do in order to prompt action on my part in the discipline associated with, with writing. Um, I had a pretty good uh, skeleton mm -hmm. outline, right? Uh, and I was able to get a couple of the first chapters through. Uh, I then took a bit of a break and realized that in order for me to get somewhere, I needed to get a little bit of, let's call it an accountability partner, right? Where I was able to um, uh, pull in an editor to help me. And I sort of set, set the guidelines of, of, I need to do these things to get to you by this date in order for then you to send them back to me for then me to follow up with my edits and then I'll send it back to you again. You know what I mean? And there's a whole lot of back and forth and back and forth and back and forth um, that, you know, I didn't necessarily appreciate in the reality of the process. In order to at least get it, I think, I feel like we have a pretty good product. Yeah. Obviously, the reviews will validate that mm -hmm. on Amazon as they tend to. Uh, but I, but I, but I think that a lot of it was, it, it was developing the, the discipline associated with the act of writing. That was, that was sort of like job number one, then surround yourself with people that can help you help move you along, which I think is true with anything you want to be successful at, find help, get a coach, get someone that can help move you along. And in this case, it was self-imposed. I, I pulled in someone and I said, 
this is the time frame I want to be doing. And so like in the fall, I actually made the bulk of my progress. So October to January is where I actually made most of the headway for, um, for the book. And, um, and then, then learning all of the process associated with what do you actually have to do to get it from final manuscript to actually like print it. Right. Yeah. Which, which is that in and of itself is like a whole other job too. Of which that was that was all sort of newer learnings in the like, you know, uh, buying an ISBN, right, as an example. If you want to retain ownership of it, of the book, right, you want you have to be able to register it, right? You've got to be able to copyright it. You have to there are so many little things in terms of both just formatting too. Unless unless you're you actually have a publisher guiding you through this, you know. It, I'm actually pub. I'm I am direct printing through Amazon, right? Mm, and so yeah. all of this is lesson learned associated with getting getting that manuscript to the point where I push it off to to um, Amazon to print it for me, right? That is also something that it has its own sort of cycle of learning as well. I, I would imagine so. Now, so I'm, I'm really curious right now, and this is very topical in the news, I feel like everyone is talking about either inflation or they're talking about the labor market in general. Uh, and it's changed so significantly over the last couple of years since COVID, yeah. right? I mean, businesses can't fill their open headcount. So, you know, I, I'm just curious from your perspective, right, uh, within the sales departments that organizations have, what has happened, right? I mean, outside of just COVID, like what what has actually happened within sales organizations around the country, maybe around the world, and what are businesses going to have to do to get these vital roles back? Yeah, I think I think it kind of starts with an exodus of a certain aspect of the population, which which is true in many many jobs. Um, sales sales happen happens to be one important one simply because it's revenue generating right so the idea of a successful salesperson is that they pay for themselves and and then pay for everybody else too right if they're doing it well right? yeah they're bringing they're bringing in the money that pays the bills right ideally that's what you want them to be able to do so i think you starts with an exodus of of uh, labor from the marketplace which creates a shortage right that shortage then has more leverage on the rest of the labor market so the jobs right that are open and people who now have more leverage than they did in the past to be able to say, um, these are the requirements that I expect as part of my employment. I also think that COVID had a really good side effect of giving people perspective on what it is that they want out of life, mm -hmm. in my opinion, right? That balance, so, and I would say this might be just a little bit of more of a US thing, Right. Sure. Where we see that um, other countries uh, actually take time off, um, that they work a little less, that they uh, expect a little bit of a different work environment. And so I think some of that is rubbing off simply because uh, we had a pandemic. Mm -hmm. And so people people want to be able to appreciate different aspects of work in a different way. And I think companies have to figure out a way to, to acknowledge that. So in this, in this case, I think this fits really well with like my first chapter in this um, clarity of, of, uh, and purpose of work that goes along with culture. So that culture of that organization needs to come through in their offering, right? In this case, adding meaning to work, adding purposeful action associated with the, we exist as a company for a purpose. We bring these things to consumers or the world, right? And you want to be part of it, right? It's a little bit of the touching on the um, Maslow's hierarchy of needs type of thing, right? Where it's where we're talking sure. about higher level needs beyond we're going to give you money for your time, right? That's a given, and that is that is like be, that is like table stakes. We need more than that. Well, and I think everybody is pushing it. To me, that's that's the difference between a transaction and a relationship. Right. Yeah. And to me, if you if you want to be able to keep people, 
for a long period of time, you have to have a relationship. Otherwise, we're just independent contractors, right? I'll sell right. your your good or service, and then I'll go sell your good or service. Yeah. But I don't I don't care about you per se. Yeah, and and I think in my in my sort of in the traditional compensation job, right? We tend to just think about the math, the money, right? Mm -hmm. What we have to really be thinking about is the total employee um, package, right? Like the, um, and there's an acronym that I'm blanking on at the moment, but it's really that that holistically, what, what all are we offering here? And yes, it's benefits, but it's much more about the, you want to be part of something bigger than yourself. Most people do want to be part of something sure, bigger yeah. than themselves. They want to contribute some of their existence into something that extends beyond them. And I think that is what employers have to be able to do in, as part of their offering. Like, come join us and do something meaningful. And yeah. we're going to pay you as well. Well, well and, and that's... Like, a... I think that goes back to like something that you know, what was it Steve Jobs said to I forget the name of the man that came over from Pepsi. Do you want to sell? You know, uh, you know, going back to the whole idea of soda, right? Do you want to sell soda the rest of your life, or do you want to do something that's going to change the world? And and that's a big thing because yeah, like I can go somewhere and get a paycheck, but if I want to change the world, and I feel like if you're passionate enough as a salesperson you're going to see the value of not only am I selling you something that's going to work for you, it's going to enrich your experience, your life. And I get to be a part of that. And I get to fit into that. It has value that goes beyond just whatever I'm being compensated for. And that makes me want to be here more. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, and, and Chris, that guy kind of goes, it's a really good segue into the next question I had, which was, I, I think the general stereotype that people have is oh well salespeople their number one motivation has to always be money and I, I i'd love you to comment on that because it sounds like there's a lot of it has to do with things outside of just the dollars and cents right there's there's feeling of being part of something that's that's bigger than just yourself for example mm -hmm. yeah i I think there is that sentiment that, that uh, salespeople are coin operated as if, as if they're just that superficial only, right? Now, let's be honest, nobody, and you guys are probably with me on this one, you don't pay attention to a job and no recruiter is going to call you if it's not a number that's bigger than what you got at the moment, right? I mean, generally yep. speaking. So, yes, it's the point of entry. It's the sign out front. But if you actually want them to walk in the door and stay a, stay a spell, right? It has to be something bigger than that. And I, th I think this is, you know, my sentiment is that's, the, that is the secret sauce, if you will, that goes, that goes into how to get people to attract people, uh, retain and motivate them, which is really the purpose of, uh, effective compensation, uh, mechanics. And that, in my opinion, includes far more than just the simple dollars and cents in sales compensation. That does include uh, a little bit more creative mechanics than it does in other aspects of business. So like in most is most jobs, you might have a base salary only or an hourly wage, right? Then you might get to a place where you have a bonus, right? In sales compensation, it's, it's a little more creative because it's a function of performance. And so there are all kinds of, let's call them a little more creative mechanics of how we deliver, like how quickly we deliver the, the money. Um, based on their performance, um, the overperformance and the accelerator, so bigger dollars for bigger performance, and and everything in between, right? I, I don't want to I don't want to bore people with that, but the but but the idea there is that there are some creative mechanics that can go into the the bigger picture of what is the offering, but everybody only ever sees like when you're on the outside, it's that yeah. well, here's the here's the total number, right? And yes, that's necessary, but. But if somebody doesn't feel like what they're doing helps other people, right? If they're somehow incongruent with their values or their purpose or their mission in life, that won't last and they won't be successful. And so those other things have to be in place. 
in order for a salesperson to also feel good about what they're giving their life and their name, right, to yep. in, in, in order to be successful. You know, so I, I think a lot of people who have worked in sales or even just know people who work in sales know how complex a compensation structure is, right? Because you're talking about, okay, well, if you meet your 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 pipeline expectation, if you Here's exceed your, your quota, then there's yeah, escalators and, yeah. and it gets really complicated, especially yeah. if you're not in sales. Do you talk about that much in the book or can you, can, how is that addressed um, in, in your mind? Yeah. Yeah. I, and, and you're absolutely right. And I tend to call that like plan mechanics. Um, but there, but there are a couple of, of components there and it depends on the type of plan somebody's on. And that's a little bit of a function of the job itself. Right. And the job itself dictates a little bit and we call it the job content, right? This is the, the duties, the responsibility, um, of, of a particular job of which we then construct and align it to whatever a market value is. Right. It, within that, you then talk about what the objectives are of the business, right? So like quota, right? And that, that quota or target is a function of your role. So like if you're a BDR, it's going to be much more of, of um, let's say, opportunities or meetings Wait, or just dials. I have yeah. to stop for a second. Acronyms. I know we've got listeners. Business like, development Wait. representative. Thank you, Alex. Appreciate My that. first role out of college. Dialing. All right. I knew what it was, but we got we got listeners. They they don't know what that acronym is, so, right, so we can continue. Thank yeah, you. So, like, think of lead generation people. That's that's what it is. You're dialing for uh, dialing for dollars, literally, just to get somebody else to pick up, to stay on the phone and not hang up on you, and try to move a, a lead to the process of handing it off to to somebody else. Really, like for for sales to to try and mm -hmm. and and really convert it into an opportunity. That's that's what is a very common, um, and as Alex can speak to, um, uh, role that has a high burnout. Um, and the function and the function there is quite literally like quantity. We then you, that's one extreme. The other uh, other extreme is a, a senior account executive that might be working on a single deal for multiple years. And you have to figure out how to compensate that person with a short-term incentive that doesn't sell a deal for three to five years, right? If we talk about like government contracts and stuff like that, mm -hmm. and you have to you have to think about about what it is that is meaningful to get people to act, right? That also aligns with with the needs of the business. And that's well. That's I'm glad you brought story. that. Yeah. I'm glad you brought that up too because Ron and I used to work together for a brief period of time. For a company that sold incredibly expensive software, that it was it was appliance based. This wasn't even SaaS, right? And you, you might go three years trying to close a deal, and then all of a sudden you get a twenty million dollar contract. Right. Monster, yeah. Now you've spent three years on that. So how do you make sure that the previous two years where they from a, from a financial standpoint, they contributed zero to the business. Yeah. How, how do you, it. how do you rectify that? And you go, well, yeah, you, you, you did horrible on paper yeah. the previous two years. You, you were, you were a burden to the business. And now all of a sudden you just brought down what they call in the industry an elephant. Yeah. The secret you, was that I in the support department always went the extra mile to help deliver it. Of course. It's okay. We're not talking about you, Ron. We're talking about sales. About okay. Sales I was never in sales. We'll let Alex talk about it. <laughs> no, but, you know, I mean, Ron, I get your point. But, like, that's got to be incredibly difficult. For sure. Yeah. And, and in, in this, that type of, in that type of case, extremely long sales cycle, uh, there's, there's, there's kind of two ways of looking at that. One might genuinely be 100% base salary. And that when the deal closes... Um, there's a big bonus that is split up across a lot of people. Um, and that's, that's not uncommon because you usually have very technical groupings of people who also contribute substantially like engineers, 
uh, scientists, um, have highly technical people who are involved through the whole cycle of time um, it, that, you know, are part of the development of that offering because, you know, it's super complicated. Uh, and so sometimes it's, it's simply like a, literally when, when the, um, the kill comes back to the village, everybody gets a share. And it only... <laughs> And it only is then when that is sort of acknowledged. Um, alternatively, what what you'll see also is uh, rewards for progression. Mm -hmm. And so very long sales cycles might be a function of getting to stages in the sales process that acknowledge whether or not someone has um, voiced the customer, you know, or, or we're on the short list and we get a letter from the, you know, like we are one of the, um, you know, two, two players, or we're, we're, we're the final, we're the final person that's, that it has approved. We just need to work through the contracting process, which in this case, if you're working with federal government could be many, 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 many months. Right. Sure. And, and so you acknowledge the, the forward progression like a BDR, right. In, in the milestones, the you got it. Same yeah. conceptual framework and acknowledge the forward momentum that goes along with that, um, where it's not translated into revenue coming in, but it's but it's still a a compensatory trigger, if you will. Yeah, yeah, because I, I mean, feel it like makes that's, sense. I feel like that's a really kind of complicated area that you can get into, especially as your product is getting launched. You've got new people, especially if you're building a company from scratch, like the company Alex and I were at before where it can be really tough. It can take a long time to build that relationship, to get them to say, let's give it a try. Let's see how it goes. Absolutely. And it, that burnout it itself can be very frustrating because Alex can probably tell you how many times he's called people to do that initial sales call. And they just want to shut you down immediately. Yeah. And it's not an easy thing. The quick math, the quick math on that is I did 200 calls a day, thousand calls a week for two years. There you go. And it's tough because, yeah, it's like, how do you keep somebody like Alex 104,000 calls. 104,000 calls. How do you keep Alex Stud happy, right, while also making sure that he is really being an advocate for your brand, for your product, long yeah. term? You know, I, I think about that in the same in the same way as I think of, of um, people that might not be part of sales normally. Um, mm -hmm. of like receptionists and I think about it from the front desk folks at like uh, hotels right and the these are the people that are genuinely your, your very first impression with the outside world and you need to make sure that they're just not perceived as peons right of like oh you get to do the dirty work and you're like just go do it and it needs to get done so somebody's got to do it like it's not a it's not a cleanup job, right? You're, you're, you're not just like mopping the floors. You are genuinely presenting yourself and your brand to prospective customers. And you do have to do a lot to make sure that those people are motivated to do a difficult, it really is a difficult job um, of trying to like turn that smile back on and dial again, right? After you get told no 42 times in a row. You know, right. yeah. so, so what you have to do is make it so that those those yeses um, are are motivating enough. Like there's a significant enough difference of the I get to be part of something. I get, I'm, I'm contributing in some way of the forward movement and the momentum so that that at least offsets the feeling of burden associ associated with like uh, that v volume based job. Yeah. So. Uh... This book that is now available on Amazon.com, look it up. It is Starting Simple Sales Compensation. We've got links in the episode description. You've got but, that. But I, I have to ask before we wrap up, this is the first book in what will ultimately be a series. Am I correct in saying that? That is the intent, yes. So so what can we expect? Uh, is, is, is Starting Simple... Uh, the tagline for, for the beginning, for all of them, uh, what is sort of, I mean, what do you anticipate in books two through 80? 
<laughs> I'm just kidding. I I assume this yeah. won't be eighty bucks. I'm just kidding. It's two uh, yeah, through fifty. Uh, let's be straight. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Let's let's yeah. be clear. Uh, eighty yeah. is ridiculous, but fifty. Fifty is normal. Is perfect. Yeah. <laughs> Perfectly normal. Um, yeah. So 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 starting simple, and I actually have a website that's going to uh, sort of support as a reference to the series. StartingSimple.co.co. Right. Um, and that's going to be something that will evolve as the books evolve. The idea here is that the next the next um, book that'll be will be more like a companion workbook. So the idea of what's in the book uh, now really prompts the reader to think about their organization and ask themselves some questions. And so I actually have like a little like end of end of each chapter a little bit of homework. The idea with the workbook it will kind of help guide them through uh, this this exercise going forward uh because the thing about sales compensation is that it only works because these are, this is the alignment of incentives right it only works for a moment in time we are quite literally aligning incentives for this particular job that does these particular things that is aligned to this particular strategy for right now as soon as the strategy changes, as soon as the job changes, as soon as the requirements or the duties change, you have to go back to the beginning and confirm that it's not just we're going to go put a Band-Aid on this and like it's good enough, we're just going to move forward. What you really want to do is ask yourself these questions again, right? And and in a small organization, strategy changes every 20 minutes or so, right? It It is a thing that changes and you have to be adapted for it. So that's... That is part of what the workbook is going to help us help guide uh, through, you know, guide an individual through in the series. I'm trying to, my thought at the moment, and so this is a little bit of foreshadow, right, as I work through these, but I do have a sort of a skeleton. We get the sneak peek between yes, two studs. We get the yes, sneak exclusively, peek. Exclusively um, but uh, to this podcast um, <laughs> is, is a... Um, um, a sort of follow-up that will be of the similar pre- um, um, uh, premise of needing to hire your first salesperson. So the same idea of some additional guidance specifically in bringing on that first salesperson. So in this case, we talk about the sales compensation components but now we're going to talk about and add a little bit to the sourcing of, of uh, people, where to look, what questions to ask in an interview, right? How do we onboard these people, right? In addition to the development of your job description, posting of the job, and, all, and what is it that you're actually looking for? Like clarifying a lot of the needs that you have right now. Not what you think you need, but what you actually need from this, from this new person. So that's that's one of them. The I have thoughts, and what I want to do is, to a certain extent, wait for some feedback for what these for for what people actually need versus what I think they need. But my thought my thought and my premise was to add a couple of um, additional um, books in the series that will help with uh, short term incentives for the small co- for mm-hmm. small companies. Like, so what do you need to know to launch uh, a bonus plan? uh as a as a small company right like mm-hmm. it's a little bit of the guided process associated with launching an, an another type of short-term incentive not sales but just like you know establishing a bonus what are the cycles what are what are the best practices what, what are you looking to do got it well chris that sounds very exciting and we are absolutely going to have you on uh, again once book number two becomes available but in the interim in the interim uh, so your book is on amazon.com go get it we'll link to it but for anyone who's interested in learning more about you maybe getting in touch with you how could they do that yeah so there's probably two two of the best ways to do it uh sales comp guy uh, dot com is the is my new website uh that's kind of the new brand um so christopher at sales comp guy dot com is the best is the best email address to get me at but i'm also on linkedin so i think um my profile so you can find christopher goff and you can kind of see my mug on there you know you'll find me not too not too hard but it's i think under christopher j goff is that sort of like you know 
the LinkedIn slash Christopher. Yeah. Jeff, I'm pretty yeah. sure is actually, you know, how you, how you find me, but those are the best ones. I'm most active on LinkedIn and, um, and uh, again, Christopher at salescompguy.com. Fantastic. Well, we will link to all of that. Chris, it's been a pleasure having you on. Been very interesting and insightful, and we can't wait to have you on once book number two is available. The sequel. You got it. Thank you. Thank you for coming on our show. Have a great one. Appreciate it.